shall we close eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for such a beautiful and wonderful day like this. Thank you, Lord, because of the blessings of shower on your people from day to day. And thank you for this glorious time, especially this day, that we remember, we commemorate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ on that glorious first Easter Sunday. Lord, we come today and we're looking unto you that that power of resurrection will continue to operate in every life in Jesus' name. And the word that you have given us, coming from Christ our Lord, that we as members of the body of Christ, one by one, family by family, and the whole church together, will hold to this word, embrace this word, keep this word, stand uncompromisingly on this word till the end of the life you have given us in Jesus name. The grace to stand, the conviction to stand, the power to stand, and the inner strength of mind to stand on the unchanging word of God, grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. And then the power, the preservation, the protection, abiding of the people that steadfastly stand on the word, you give to every one of us in Jesus' name. Bless us today, Lord, that we'll take this message and take it to the very far ends of the world, that they too will be able to stand uncompromisingly on this same world. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at the word of God this morning. We'll be talking about power. And we shall be talking about power because we said this is a retreat of the tenfold increase of power. I was spoken about power in various areas of the Christian life, of the Christian commitment, power in our personal lives, power in fellowship as believers come together in fellowship and love and unity, power that prevails prevailing with God and prevailing with men and the power of redemption, the redemptive power that's the power that comes as a result of the finished redemptive work of Christ at Calvary and then that awesome power that great power that irresistible power of a holy life, a life fully surrendered to God, a life fully yielded to God, a life that is cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, a, li a life that is so cleansed and pure and holy and sanctified, it's a replica of the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, the awesome power, the great power abiding on such a life. And then was spoken about the power of the heavenly vision going on the way from here to there. And then the Almighty God confronts you. And then he challenges you about the past. And he reveals himself for the present. And then he makes you to look ahead what the rest of your life should look at and should look for. And then should focus on. And then he gives you a vision from heaven. And he says, hold this. That's the heavenly vision. And go with you till the end of your life. The power of the heavenly vision. When you hold on to that vision, when you abide in that vision, 
when you focus on that vision, when you concentrate on that vision, when you lay your hands on the plow, and you will not look back, when you will not look to the left or to the right, but the vision is what is before you all the time. The awesome power, the great power that abides in the life of a man, a woman of vision. The vision that you have on the way to Damascus. And Paul the Apostle said, O King Agrippa, since I got that vision, I cannot think of any other thing. I cannot look any other direction. The only thing, the central thing that moves me and motivates me is the power of that heavenly vision. And if you are in this world, you don't have any vision, any goal any commitment, any aspiration, any ambition, and you are here and there, and your life is flattened out, and you labor, you don't know what you are laboring for because there is no vision. I invite you today, when this vision comes into your life, the power that it gives you and the focus on that vision, that nothing will distract you. Nothing will make you think of any other thing. It is just that heavenly vision. Not earthly vision, not temporary vision, not personal vision, not selfish vision. The heavenly vision, the power of such a vision. And then, how far can we go in life? Even with a great vision, without love, without fellowship, without forgiveness, without faithfulness. You know, when you're carrying, it's like this, brothers and sisters, when you are very young, when you were first born into the, the first day, you are born into this world. There was no body. I want you to imagine a sack. I want you to imagine a bag that has a rope and is tied to the neck. The day you were born, there was nothing in that sack. You were free. That's why you shouted, you cried, you kicked, you smiled, you did everything. Start naked, without any shame. And then as you were growing up, there were things that were coming into that sack. Offense here. Offense there. And the message, and the bag was setting full. The, the greater, the higher you are growing, the bag on your back was growing. By the time you came to your twenties, the bag was so heavy. The remembrance of what this has done, what that has done, what that has done, and then it bends you down. By the time you become fifty or sixty, the bag on your back is so heavy. But the remembrance of what people did you see so upon, and except you drop that bag, it will be so heavy, you'll not even have strength enough to carry the bag on your back, not to talk of carrying any other load. But it's the forgiveness that says, all those things in the bag at my back, I forgive them, and I forget what they have done. I just forbear, let it go. And now there's going to be fellowship. And then there is going to be faithfulness. And when that bag is caught off you, you become as free as you were when you were born. All of a sudden, there is spring in your steps. Forgiveness has come. The bag is uploaded. And then you run like a six-year-old fellow. Because now there is power in forgiveness. There is power in fellowship, and there is power in faithfulness, and then the power of His Word. You begin to study the Word, the Word of God. This Word has power, has power on high, has power here on earth, has power below. And when you think of the Word, the Word you are receiving, the power of His Word, the power that created the whole universe, and then the faith power that moves mountains. How can you be in a retreat, a conference like this, and then you go back home, and then you complain about a mountain here? You get up and you remember what you heard. That whosoever shall say unto this mountain, 
I don't care who originated that one. I know it's not God. Because, you know, the mountains originated by God, they have their purpose. But the mountains originated by Satan. By evil spirits and evil powers. And you rise up and you say, I have my life to live. And nobody will put a mountain before you that will hinder you from making progress. And therefore you say, for this time, once and for all, I want to live a life, a life that soars, a life that goes up like an eagle. And therefore, if there's any mountain ahead of you, whoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea. You even tell the destination of that mountain. And then you say, now that the mountain is gone, I have something to do. And then you concentrate your life on what you need to do. And the power of God's presence, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Of whom shall I be afraid? And the promise of power, the power of the Holy Ghost upon your life. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and then unto the uttermost part of the earth. That makes you effective. You have the power, now you can witness effectively. The power of witnessing effectively. And then the power of self-denial. Self-denial, self-denial. You know, some things will come to your life that, you know, it will be like self-indulgence, but it will make you kind of drowsy and heavy. You know, it's like when you eat too much, your bread is still there, but it doesn't function well. Your energy is still there, but it doesn't get you out to go do what you ought to do because you're eating too much self-indulgence. But you see, all those things that are coming into my life, and it makes me feel heavy and drowsy and idle and indolent and willing to rise up and face my vision. All those things, I remove them. The power of self-denial that makes us have the victory of self. And then your words, those are sharp words like arrows. A sharp, a sharp words coming out of your mouth. And you don't talk much. You don't talk much. You reserve what you say until the devil shows up. You don't talk much. You reserve what you're going to say until those demons, if they forget themselves, and if they forget where you are coming from, until they show up. And then you begin to speak. You don't talk much. Until those problems arise again. And then when they arise, I say, uh -huh, this is the time to talk. And then you utter those words. There's power in the words of those people who reserve the expense or the use of their spiritual energy until the appropriate time when it is the right time to speak. Then the power, explosive power, over on sin forces. You've got that already. I said you've got that already. You are anointed for ministry. You are empowered for service. And from now on, no sin power. You know what they call the sin power? You know those boys, they are real. But you know, they are behind the closed door. They are behind the coaching. And they hide themselves. And then they, from their hiding place, in their trenches, they want to be throwing something at you. And there you stand. Or the gifts of the Spirit in your life. And then you say, all those unseen forces, and you know, you have the final say. You have the final say. Because the Lord has given you that power is the power coming from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you open your mouth, you don't open your mouth just anyhow, just any time. When you, when you decide to open your mouth, power will come out. And then the Christian family, that loving family in fellowship, no offense, 
loving bottled up. Just loving one another as Christ has loved the church, the power of such a family. Now, after you've got all that, you don't even want to go back. You don't even want to think about any other thing. Because once you've tasted this power from on high, you don't want to exchange it for any other thing. And there may be some agents of Satan or some emissaries of the enemy that will try to cajole you, to deceive you, and to maybe just make you see some things that glitter and they are not gold. And they want to say, can you drop what you have and take this? You look at them stretch in the eyes and you say, no, I've got the very best the highest and the greatest and I'm not about to exchange what I have with any other thing that's what leads to the, to the uncompromising lie and this morning the Lord is going to inject into us it's going to fill us with that spirit of the conqueror that never compromises you'll never compromise again in your life the mind, the heart, the spirit that says, this is where I am going. And then the people say, but there are dangers there. Say, leave them with me. There are difficulties there. Leave them with me. There are challenges there. Leave them with me. That you will go through all those problems and dangers and difficulties. And when you get there, the Lord vanish away. And you know, you, you've been here for a long time, many of you, you've been, you know, you can even preach this thing I'm preaching, but I'm going to tell you, know, that my hero, my mentor, John Wesley, you know, I talk about him all the time. He was preaching holiness, sanctification, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then a mob came out, a great mob. And they were carrying gloves in their hands. You know, it was that time, more than 200 years ago, it wasn't a civilized world. They could do anything, you know, almost jungle kind of life, lifestyle. And he told John Wesley, my hero and your hero, my mentor and your mentor, everything I learned, it was an education. Much of it came from him. Everything you know, much of it came from him. And he told him, the mob is waiting for you. And then they said, don't go out at this time. And John Wesley just speak the Bible. And then he came. And then those people looking at their faces, they were angry. And then he was coming. And then he was walking majestically. Like the child of the king, like you are. I said, like you are. And then when he got to them, they dropped all their clubs. And John Wesley said he had a great congregation and he prayed to all of them. You see, whatever dangers are in the way, if you have the uncompromising spirit, you will get through. As we look at Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 52, I'm reading from verse 1. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. O captive daughter of Zion, for thus says the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord of the Lord God, My people went now aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught. They that rule over them, make them to howl, says the Lord, 
and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good things, of good, that publisheth salvation, that says unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. That watchmen shall lift up the voice, for the boys together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. He's telling us about the redeemed of the Lord, the people of God, when we're redeemed, when we're cleansed. When we are prepared like a great, formidable, mighty army. And then he says, we see eye to eye. And that unity of understanding, unity of knowledge, unity in doctrine, standing by that same word. Not looking here or looking there, but united in the teaching of the totality of the revealed word of God. And it says to break forth into joy and sing together. He was places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. When you stand uncompromisingly, on the word of God. And you do not look here, look there, modify this, mutilate this, and change this. And we all stand on that same word of God. From Zion, from Jerusalem, to the other parts and other cities of the nation. From the capital, from the headquarters, to all the parts where the body of Christ is named. And we're standing on the same thing without compromise, without fear. What glory that will be, what victory that will be, what salvation it will pronounce and proclaim and reveal to the nations around. The patchy, the patchy. Go here from there, touch no unclean sin. The life without compromise is not only in doctrine, it's in deed, in character, in lifestyle, in behavior. On compromises stand doctrinally, yes. On compromises stand in character as well, in behavior as well. The patchy, the patchy. Go ye out from there, touch no clean thing. Go ye out from the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, the Lord tells us that in the last days, there will be lots of compromises, but he will have a remnant view. He will have a group of people. That even though there may be people on the left, on the right, at the center everywhere, backsliding and compromising, it will have some people that will hold the fort, that will hold on until he comes. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. I shall deceive many, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse different many places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then 
shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Affliction will try to change your conviction. Persecutors will try to change your stand. Other people ridiculing you, persecuting you, belittling you will try to change. But you believe will try to make you compromise. They shall deliver you or to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended. I shall betray one another. I shall hate one another. Do you see this? Number one, they will be offended. And they will not have any grace to forgive. When there is an offense and there is no grace to forgive, then the next step, they will betray one another. They will betray one another to the hands of people that want to hurt and injure. It begins with offense, unforgiven. An offense that we don't overlook. An offense that look, well, and that's just one of the things. Get by, don't just go your way. When you don't overlook it, it will lead to betrayal. And then after that, to hatred. Shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But, but, there are still some people, but, thank God I'm one of them. I said, thank God I'm one of them. It says, but he that shall endure unto the end, we shall endure to the end. You will endure to the end. When you have the power on your compromising life, the decision that come what may, the courage that come what may, the spirit of the conqueror that come what may, and you have tasted of this power of resurrection working in your soul, in your mind, in your heart. And you say, let, like, like Martin Luther said, let all the demons be as many as the tiles on that land. I will go to that place and declare, the just shall be saved by faith. And when you understand that this spirit of the conqueror lives and abides within you, and there is not a devil out of hell that can overcome the power of the Almighty God in your soul, in your spirit, in your heart. Then you know your stand. The winds of change will not blow you down, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's what we are talking about, the power of an uncompromising life. Uncompromising life. That's the one that holds on to the word of God and refuses to bend, to bulge, or to change, to cower, or to be conquered. I divide the message into three parts. Number one, the pattern and the perseverance of an uncompromising life. What's the pattern of life? For those who refuse to compromise the pattern and the perseverance of an uncompromising life. Number two, the perversion and the perdition of a compromising life. The jellyfish. The one that has no backbone. The amphibian is neither on land nor in the sea. The worm that is wriggling and wiggling. That is easily, easily turned around by little problem. The little ant that goes on meandering and will not follow its straight course because of the obstacles that challenge its movement. A compromising life, the perversion and the perdition of such a life. Number three, the protection and the preservation of an uncompromising life. I come to number one, the pattern and the perseverance of an uncompromising life. There's a pattern they follow. There's a kind of life they live. 
There's a kind of posture they maintain. There's a kind of conviction they maintain. They have a pattern. Those people don't compromise. They have a kind of perseverance. The heat is increasing. They persevere. The challenges are getting greater. They persevere. The enemies are multiplying. They persevere. The noise of the opposition party is getting greater. They persevere. And it appears the support for the opposition is getting greater. They persevere. They have a pattern. They have a perseverance. The pattern. And the perseverance of an uncompromising life. Psalm 112, Psalm 112. Verse 6. Surely he shall not be moved forever. That's the uncompromising man. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. This uncompromising believer, surely, you can go and come back again. Surely, you leave him in the midst of the heat and you go and do something and you come back a few months after. Surely, the man is still standing there. That's the uncompromising man. Surely, he shall not be moved forever. Persecution from the husband. And you are thinking, this woman. Will she remain? Will she stay? And the persecution from the in-laws, this woman, will she stay? Will she remain in the experience of salvation, in the experience of holiness she has God? This woman, with everybody throwing the arrows of attack, affliction upon her, will she stand? Surely, they shall not be moved forever. This young man that just got this job and he said, don't bring Christianity into this place. This is not church. This is company. And, and he said, no, I'm a Christian in church. I'm a Christian in the place of work. I'm a Christian every time. And this is my principle of living. Oh, and he said, your eyes will see something. You will smell pepper here if you stand by that. And it's still there after some months, after some years. It's still there. And it's still taking its time. What he said, he will not do, he will not do. There was psychological oppression. There was physical assault. There was verbal abuse. And yet, this individual will not stand, will not compromise. That's what we are talking about. And it says, surely, you know, when you, if you are working in the bank, if you are working in some offices, and they say, this is what you do, I'll say, no, I'm a man of principle. I have the principle guiding me. I have something underneath me. The solid ground of the doctrines of the Bible. I cannot do that. And then they come at you from every direction. And they show you on their faces. And they show you in their action. And they show you in their behavior. And they write even some secret letters to you. To make you afraid. And make you tremble in your heart. And then you say no. I got another letter, and that letter is from Christ. It says, I'm with you. I'm watching over you. Nothing will hurt you. Before this other letter came, I got one from the headquarters, from heaven, that says, I'll be with you always till the end of the world. And because I got that, and I believe that, this other one that came means nothing. And so you keep on standing. That's the pattern of a life that is uncompromising. That's the perseverance of a life that is uncompromising. Surely he shall not be moved forever. A righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. You know, there are some people 
like a Sambalat and Tobiah, he said to Nehemiah, and you know, it was all like, it was all like, just to intimidate him, to make him afraid, to make him shit his ground, to make him less him, his commitment to the building of the walls of the city. And he said, he said, they are coming for you. He said, let them come. This will not be the first time they are coming at anybody. Let them come. There is a God in heaven. I'm doing a great work. Can I come down to come and hide in one place? You see, when you are compromising, it doesn't matter the tidings or the news that they bring. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. Trust him in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees desire upon his enemies. You will stand. Give me a good amen. He can cross amen. In Job chapter 17. Job chapter 17. I will read from verse 9, Job chapter 17. The righteous also shall hold on his way. You know, the righteous has his way. Just like the drunkard has his way, the liar has his way, the righteous has his way. The people of the world have their ways. The politician has his way. Also, the righteous has his way. The drunkard is holding on to his way. The politicians are holding on to their ways. The seller is holding on to his way. Why is it only the righteous who are not holding on onto his way? We're living in the same world. And you see those politicians. And you see everything coming against them. And you see the court is coming against them. And the appeal court is coming against them. And the Supreme Court is coming against them. And the newspapers are coming against them. And the little, little children that don't know whether those things are true or not, they are coming against them. Those politicians, their names and the mouths of everybody, and they chew them, they be too strings stick. And the politician holds on to his way. I about the righteous? If all those people, are, if they are facing the heat of the fire, and they hold on to their way, and it's ready to disqualify them, and you will not, you will not take part in the election. And they keep on campaigning, and they keep on smiling and laughing. And we see them in the picture, and they hold on to their way. I am the Christian. I am the child of God. I am the one that has the heavenly vision. I am the one that has the word of the Almighty God. The righteous shall hold on to His way. He that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. In verse 10, but as for you all, ye do return and, and come now. For I cannot find one wise man among you. Job was talking to his counselors, the people that were, you know, coming at him. He said, don't worry, everything you say, I don't agree, but I'm holding on to my way. And then in verse 11, my days are past, but I'm holding on to my way. My purposes are broken up, but I'm holding on to my way. Even the thoughts of my heart, they change the night into day. The light is short because of darkness, but I'm holding on to my way. That's a pattern of an uncompromising life. That whatever comes, whatever goes, whatever stays, Whatever sheeps, the righteous will hold on unto his way. And let me show you an example in Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. Verse 7. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. 
and he, and he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with down and he sat down among the ashes that was bad that was painful this was unexpected for a righteous man what came upon him then said his wife unto him does thou still does thou still retain thine integrity cause god and die you know the wife might just be preaching the husband this is too much how could you go through this are you still holding on to your integrity still holding on to your principle still holding on to your righteousness still holding on to the doctrine i about all these things and your wife i look at your head i look at your face i look at your back you cannot see i look at you to the soles of your feet everything is so bad you scrape i help you scrape and you are lying in ashes why don't you die cause god and die you know it comes to a level that even those who are supporting you before will say this is enough this is a gauge there's a limit there's a height why don't you give up at this time if it's just to bend a little why don't you just bend a little this is too much you have only one life to live how many days do you have left to live and see what you are going through we pity you if i were you i will bend i will cheat i will change Whatever will happen, let it happen. The, the worst will be that you die. Cause God and die. And then verse 10. But she said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. Only foolish people compromise. Only foolish people look at the pain they have. And they do not look at the glory they are going to possess. Only, only foolish people look at what they are going through today and they don't look at what they are going to possess and have in the future. Wise people consider the end. And Job said, you speak as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive evil in all this did not Job sin with his leaves that's a pattern of an uncompromising life Exodus in Exodus chapter 10 Exodus chapter 10 we're looking at verse 7 Exodus chapter 10 reading from verse 7 and Pharaoh's servant said unto him how long shall this man be a snail to us let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed and Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh. And he said unto them, Go serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go with you? That shall go. And Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with all our herds. When we go, for we must hold the feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go. And your little ones, look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. A Pharaoh said, No, we have to strike a compromise. I called you. And I said, All right, I'm going to release you now. And I said, How many of you are going? And you're mentioning all these. How can it be? All right, let's be reasonable. Let's strike a compromise. Not so. Go now. Ye that are men and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire. And when, and they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. 
Because they disagreed. Moses said, no, we're not compromising, we're not changing, we're not modifying it. And as they went, they called them again. Exodus chapter 10 verse 24. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. He shifted a little. He said, Now I've tried my best. I've permitted you now. You can go. Originally I said, only you men, your little ones will not go. And then I got angry with you. But all right now, let's be reasonable. Moses, if this is what you are asking for, and now I allow you, and I said, your little ones can go with you now, but the flocks will remain behind. So five, and Moses said, thou must Give us also the sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. That's the spirit of an uncompromising man, uncompromising life. What we said originally, that's where we're still staying. Not an hoof will stay behind, will be left behind. But thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come either. Verse 28, And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee for me. Take it to thyself. See my face no more. For in that day thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And Moses said, That's all right, thou hast spoken when I will see thy face again no more. You see, the uncompromising man is not saying, Okay, Pharaoh has even given us up to this point. Why don't we just take it and go? No, you will not compromise. I said you will not compromise. Everything the Lord desires for you to do, you will do. Everything the Lord desires for you to say and to preach, you will say and preach. There's no compromise. Why don't you just give in a little? No, we cannot give in. This is thus says the Lord. Look at chapter 12. In chapter 12, we're looking at verse 31. And he called Moses at a later time. And he ran by night and said, rise up. I get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said, and take your flocks and your herds as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. That's the result of remaining uncompromising, standing on the word of God. You will not change. You will not beg. You will stand on this word of God until the end of your life in Jesus' name. How about the people that change? Point number two, the perversion and the perdition of a compromising life. The perversion and the perdition of a compromising life. Proverbs chapter 24. Verse 19, fret not thyself because of evil men. Till the end of the age, there will be evil men in every city, evil men in every country, evil men in every continent, evil men in the world. They will all be there. They will not die. Some of them live long. So don't hope all the evil men will die. There will be no trouble. Trouble is going to be in the world. This is the world. But fret not thyself. Don't concern yourself. Don't worry about all those evil men. They will be there. And yet you have a calling. And yet you have a goal. And yet you have a conviction. And yet you have a doctrine to, to protect. And yet you have a line to live. Pledge not thyself because of evil men. Neither be thou envious of the wicked. For there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. My son, 
fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. Those are the compromisers. Meddle not with them that are given to change. They will be living a kind of life now when they are in the midst of the believers. And when they go into the midst of their own believers, and those some believers put some pressure on them, they are given to change. They surrender their heart. They surrender their soul. They surrender their will. They surrender everything within them to the people that put pressure on them. And the Lord is saying, you don't do that. You shouldn't do that. Meddle not for them that are given to change. For their calamity shall rise suddenly. The compromises, their calamity, their judgment, their punishment, their perdition. For their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? Let's look at Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49, I'm reading from verse 3 to the first part of verse 4. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power, unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel. Look at the qualities in verse 3. Might, strength, dignity, power, excellency. And yet, unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel. You see those who are not stable. Those who are not consistent. Those who are not steady. Those who are not foresight, those who are not faithful, those who are not dependable, whatever qualities they have. You know that's why some people say that courage is number one of the virtues. Because if you are intelligent but you are not courageous, that intelligence will amount to nothing. If you are knowledgeable and you are not courageous with conviction, that knowledge will amount to nothing. If you're visionary and you are not courageous, that vision will amount to nothing. That's why it's so important, whatever you have, the excellency and the might and the power and the strength, everything, then you become stable, steady, dependable, trustworthy. But to see the perversion of those who are compromising, and let's look at judges. I don't know whether you've seen this before. What a pity for him. We're looking at Judges chapter 8. In Judges chapter 8, we're looking at verse 22. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us, he was a great deliverer, from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So far, so good. So far, so great. So far, so commendable. Gideon had got real great victory for the children of Israel. And they so much appreciated the victory. And he said, Gideon, we surrender to you. Come, rule over us. He said, no. Let your son rule over us. No. Even after your son is gone, your son's son shall rule over us. Said, no, the Lord shall rule over you. Isn't that great? What spirit of humility is that? But read on. Verse 24. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that ye would give me every man the golden earrings, and the earrings of a spray. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. That's the people they conquered. And he answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread the garment. And did cast therein every man the earring of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings 
that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold. Beside the ornaments and the colors and the purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chains that were about their camels' necks. Verse 27, And Gideon made an effort thereof, and put it in a city, even in Ophrah, and all Israel went thither, a warring after it, which became a snare unto Gideon and his house. He passed one test, he failed the other test. Gold, silver, jewelry, the attractions of the ornaments of the world. He became an idol, failed. And not just him, all the people of Israel went astray. Along with him, became a snare. First Kings chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12, the perversion of those who compromise. First Kings chapter 12, reading from verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and dwelt therein, and went out from thence, and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, that's where compromise begins. Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If these people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of these people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Jeroboam had been given part of the kingdom by the Lord himself. But now he became afraid. And he said, How can I keep my position? That's how compromise begins. Don't keep your position, just keep yourself. God will take care of the position. How will I keep my royalty? That's the problem. Don't keep your royalty, just keep yourself. And the Lord will take care of the royalty. This exalted stage in which I am, how can I keep it? Don't worry about that. You just keep yourself in the love of God, in the center. Of the will and the word of God. Just live the way you ought to live. And the Lord who gave it to you originally will preserve it. You see, the self-management. That's what brings compromise. And then he began now and he devised a method. By which he thought he'll keep his position as king over them. And I told them, look at verse 28. Wherefore the king took himself. And he made two cows of gold, idol. I said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. He says, I'm thinking about you. The energy it takes. The effort it takes. For you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy God, so Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. This thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. You see, that became a sin on them. It's self-management. What are you setting up? So that instead of allowing the people to focus on Christ, and the teaching of Christ, and the authority of Christ, and the foundation of Christ, then you are diverting the attention to this so that it will come back to you. It will keep your position. That is what will make you to lose what you have got. What the Lord originally gave you is a path of the compromiser, is a pattern of the compromiser. And that is what brings punishment and perdition to the compromiser. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed 
from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. The Galatian believers had swerved, they had changed, they had collapsed, they couldn't stand anymore. They were believing the true gospel, the only gospel, and the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, some people came to them and began to tell them some other things about the law of Moses, about circumcision. And they were telling them, you know, you have to add this and add this and add that. They were telling them, Jesus is not enough. You must make some sacrifices. You must have circumcision. You must add that circumcision to Christ before you can be saved. And you are accepting. It's like those of us who are here who have learned it that the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary has given us everything we will ever need. But some people are telling us, no, Jesus is not enough. You must add this. You have the whole Bible. And you know what? How to pray? And somebody is bringing a prayer book. When you have an enemy, it's how to pray. We didn't give you that one here. That's an addition. When you have a major problem, you're having a dream like this, then you open to this other page. It's how to pray. And secretly, if you are a compromiser, you're already praying that way. And with all that we're learning of the words of Jesus, love your enemies, bless them that cause you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Those are the words of Christ. And be merciful as your Father which is in heaven is merciful. No, that's not enough for some people. They'll go and take this prayer book that will show them how to pray, to conquer, to defeat, to destroy their enemies. And you have your Bible. You have the deeper life case, then you have the book, the compromiser, the perdition of the compromiser. And Paul the Apostle said, I marvel and surprised that ye are so so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. Perversion of the gospel. This pure gospel, it has no hatred in it. This pure gospel, it has no manipulation in it. This pure gospel is plain. And the whole totality, the sum of her relationship. Whether with your wife, with your friend, with your neighbor, with your enemy, with your persecutor, the sum total of the thing that the Lord wants us to have to everybody is love. And yet, there are people that pervert this gospel. That's why now the, the, the apostles said by inspiration in verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which, he, which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. The we, even those of us that preached to you before on this pulpit, on the polite pulpit, if any of us, an overseer, a coordinator, a pastor, a penny of us will secretly introduce another thing to you and say, no, Jesus is not the only way. Then he gives us another way. Do this, add this, this plant, 
need to see to a base that the healing is now in the plant. The healing is no more in the name of Jesus. The prosperity is no more depending upon the Lord. He's giving bride. If any of us that preach the word of God to you before, if we turn around and we tell you another thing, if your sister, if your brother, if your fellowship leader, if your coordinator, if your wife, if your husband, or any of your children, if they come to you to tell you what was said before, that's not enough. Prayer, that's not enough. Faith will be mounted, that's not enough. The name of Jesus, that's not enough. The power of the Holy Ghost, that's not enough. And they say, add this, whoever they are, whoever they are. Even if it's we, one of our team, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now, again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. I will not be accursed. I will stand on this world. And, and you know, you know, you are members of the church, the majority of us here, you, you heard me more than 30 years, some of you. And it's the same. I may use alliterations now. I may use method. That's method. My communication method may, you know, be adapted as I'm growing and learning about communication for the real content of the message. The real value of the message. The real insight. The meat of the message. The real thing that I say, the doctrine, you know, is still the same. And you know, as I'm getting nearer, getting nearer, I'm still young at heart. I'm still standing and running. But you know, at least, you know, the, the old age is coming on the head. The young life is in the heart. Are you happy? I still have a lot of years to go. Praise the Lord. You know, you know, with a little food and a little love and a little, you know, a little exercise and a little thing, you know, we still have many years to go. But all the same, I'm not as young as I was when the product started in 1973. And yet, and yet, I'm still preaching the same thing to you. If God can help me, and I've gone through three can see, and I've gone through this and that, and the churches, many of the churches, you know, in the early years, almost all the churches will chew my name in their mouths. And then some of us who are going to those churches before we started Sunday worship, they, they, they will say, if you are going to then they'll mention my name and see if you know it is the name you get from the toilet. And then they'll say, stand up, and they'll talk and talk. We went through all that, and by the grace of God, I'm still standing. And I will keep on standing. And you are my children. You will stand with me in Jesus' name. Like father, like children. That's what we know for everywhere. We're going to stand. Because we will not pervert this gospel. We will not destroy this gospel. We will not add anything to this gospel. And this gospel is powerful. This gospel is mighty. And the Lord will protect you while you are standing with this gospel in Jesus' name. In Jeremiah, I'm going to point number three now. Point number three, the protection, the preservation of an uncompromising life. Protection, preservation of an uncompromising life. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17. Thou therefore gather of thy loins and arise. Speak unto them all that I command thee. That's difficult for some people. Speak unto them all that I command thee. That's so hard. 
an uncompromising stand, uncompromising life, that wherever you find yourself, stand on the word, speak the word, and declare the whole truth without modification. Thou therefore get up thy loins, buckle your belt, arise, speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not displayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, an iron pillar, raising walls against the whole land and against the kings of Judah. Against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, against the people of the land, they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. If you stand on this word of God, they may fight against you. They will not prevail against you in Jesus' name. And you know why some people compromise? They say their lives are in the hands of the enemy. They have forgotten there is a God in heaven who determines the bounds of countries and determines the lengths of time you have to live on earth. And it says, I will fulfill all your days. You see, they are so much afraid. And they say, if I keep on preaching this and preaching that and standing on the word of God, they will get me. They will cut short my life. They put their minds away from the Almighty God and they think that their hearts or their lives are in the hands of men. Your life is not in the hand of men. Your life is in the hand of the Almighty God. God doesn't have too many people who are standing on the world. If you have only a few workers, and those workers are dependable and trustworthy. You want to keep them by all means. You want to protect them by all means. If you look at the world, God doesn't have too many people standing on the whole Bible. If you look at all the churches, God doesn't have too many people standing on all the doctrines of the Bible. If you look at the world at the church, you don't have too many churches that will go from chapter to chapter, from verse to verse, and will not omit anything. This church is one of the few that God has that will go through the whole Bible without hiding anything. God doesn't have too many of us, just a few. He's a reasonable God. He'll protect the few. He'll protect you. I said He'll protect you. It's difficult to find a replacement for you. He'll protect you when you are a worker. And it's difficult to replace Him. You have put so much in Him. You've invested so much in Him. And you've given everything, the train, all the training you can give. You've given it to Him. If you lose that worker, if you get another worker, you know it will take you another 10 years to be able to raise this new worker to the level of this other worker. This one is almost indispensable. That's how indispensable you are. All that God has taught you is going to be difficult to find a replacement. God will not joke with your life. He will protect you. And think about me. He doesn't have too many people like this that will stick their neck into the trouble and declare the totality of the word of God and will not mind who hates him, who likes him. God doesn't have too many people like this. He has to protect this man here. He'll protect me. And he will protect you. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail. And the Lord says, For I am with you, says the Lord to deliver you. I congratulate you that you are here. And I just love you. When I finish, I'm not finished yet. I'm not talking about the message. I'm thinking, I'm talking about ministry. When I finish, and I'm ready to go, if Jesus tarries, and then I look at you, I'll be so happy. I say, get the baton. I throw it to you. You'll catch it. All the running I did now, you will start running again. <laughs> Rise up on your feet and say, the baton is coming to me. If the Lord helps our general superintendent, the Lord will help me. He'll help you. 
we will do it together. We join our hearts together. We join our hands together. We join our courage together. We will not compromise. We will stand. You are standing with me. I am standing with you. We're going to walk together. We're going to preach this word together. We will not compromise. We're going to have the protection, the preservation of the people that stand true and faithful to the word of God for the rest of their lives. Commit yourself to the Lord. You are precious in the sight of the Lord. Don't have any fear. The angels are surrounding you. The Almighty God is watching over you. There's a lot of talent inside you there that is for the kingdom of God. There's a lot of things deposited in your heart over there that is for the kingdom of God. There's a lot of creativity inside there deposited into you by the kingdom of God. Because of what God has deposited in you, He will preserve your life. He will protect you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Who can touch you? Who can touch you? You are a special instrument to the kingdom of God. Do you think it's easy to replace you? No, my dear sister. You are special. No, my dear brother. You are special. You have a part in this ministry. You have a part in this work. That will be difficult to replace. You cannot die now. God will not allow you to die. We will not allow you to die. The church will not allow you to go. We need you. God needs you. The kingdom of God needs you. Your family needs you. And these young people, these youths, they need you. So give them this word of life, this bread of life. What you are doing, God appreciates. And therefore he will protect you. He will preserve you. A child of the kingdom, a minister, a servant. Preach without fear, serve without fear, without compromise. Nobody can get you, nobody can catch you, nobody can destroy you, nobody within or without. Precious valuable indispensable god is watching over you he does watch over his watch just watch over his watch uncompromising they won't touch your business don't worry about that they won't touch your children don't worry about that leave them in the hands of god just focus your attention on the work the Lord has given you to do. He will keep you. You know who you are from today. You know how precious you are from today. And anytime the devil is trying to use discouragement and saying, I don't think I will go there today. If you don't go, who will come? If you don't come, who will come? Your place is there. Your seat is there. Your chance is there. Your ministry is there. A lot inside that heart of yours that has been given to you to deposit and to, to give to the church. Don't allow this coin may come. Come and give it to us. Come and give it to us. Come and give it to us. Yes, you say we have other people there. None of them can replace you. Come, come. We need you. Give us the word of life.
God is blessing you already. He is preparing you for greater exploits already. Deepen your feet into the rock of ages. Whatever winds may blow, stand fast. The angels are looking at you. Men are looking at you. The children are looking up to you. They see your grace stature standing to declare the truth to this generation. Keep on standing. You see what you have brought to the body of Christ? You see the talent you have brought? You see the encouragement you have brought? You see the stability you have brought? Has anybody told you how your life has challenged them in the place of work? That's why they call you pastor. That's why they call you those great ministerial names in your place of work. They know you. If you compromise, angels will be disappointed. The church will be disappointed. Even unbelievers will be disappointed. They know you. They know you. Stand true to your calling. You will not compromise. And God will bless you. God will bless you. He will show His appreciation for you by blessing you tremendously, abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm so happy you are here. Are you happy you are here? Even those of you that didn't minister, and some of you, our preachers that didn't preach at this time, just to see you standing there. What a glory it is. And as if I'm so happy just to see you, I'm wondering how God, how happy God is just to see you there. God is happy about your life, about your stability, about your standing. And you know some people, if they saw you at home, if you didn't come for the retreat, some believers, some believers, if they saw you at home, although they didn't come, if they saw you, they say, ah, although they are not believers, they say, ah, brother, if you didn't go, they say, where? to your retreat and then it will shock you they say why are you here why didn't you go even not believers they are happy you are here god is happy <laughs> praise the lord we will not miss you out god will not miss you out and this Bible that you are carrying, the Bible will carry you. The Bible you support, this Bible will support you. I need Jesus tarries, and I'm about to go. I'll go joyfully when I remember that you are there, you are there, you are there. You will carry on. Will you not carry on? No way. Raise your hand to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for these wonderful people of God. It is your grace that has made us wonderful. And we pray that this wonder of grace will remain ever in our lives in Jesus' name. All our overseers, all our pastors, all our leaders everywhere, at the headquarters in the country, Nigeria, all over Africa, Europe, UK, Britain, America, Asia, everywhere. Oh Lord, we pray you will keep every one of us faithful in Jesus' name. Let your glory shine upon everyone. And Lord, give spirit of the conqueror. Let it remain in us forever in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray this work will prosper in our hands. 
Lord, the devil will never take us away from our stand of the uncompromising life. We will stand until the end. Even though iniquity may abandon the love of many outside, may what's called we have made up our minds. We're going to endure until the end. The grace, the fortitude, the courage to endure to the end. Give to every brother, every sister, every young person in Jesus' name. <laughs> Cleanse everyone. Make us stable and solid in the Christian faith. And Lord, we pray, we'll grow to the point we'll be able to do exploits for the glory and the name of the Lord. Lord, we pray you'll protect everyone. While we're standing, the devil, with all his messengers, will not be able to touch anything that belongs to us. Watch over your people till the very end. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much and God bless you.